Hello, I'm Stephen Davison, Head of Digital Library Development at the Caltech Library. I'm joined today by Mike Hucker, Research Applications Developer at the Library, who is the Principal Architect of our Controlled Digital Lending Application, DIBS, or Digital Borrowing Service. During the pandemic, controlled digital lending has received a lot of attention, and versions have been utilized by a number of institutions and services, such as the Hathi Trust Emergency Temporary Access Service, the In Internet Archives National Emergency Library, and Brown and Princeton Universities, among others, both of whom have presented on their controlled digital lending services at previous DNI forums. Our objective here today is to share Caltech's thinking behind developing our own solution, walk through the resulting application, and discuss future developments in our local context. As the title of our presentation suggests, we see controlled digital lending as a key piece of service architecture extending beyond the pandemic. Until now, most library services have tended to be either very open, as is the case of most digital library and repository collections, or highly controlled, as with our physical and licensed collections. As library collections and services become increasingly fragmented, we need more flexibility in the way we provide access. During the pandemic, we all shared similar needs to provide access to materials and services that would normally be accessed in physical form. None of our existing systems had the right functional mix, which highlighted the problem inherent in having a variety of specialized systems with many components with overlapping functions, but just not the right mix for the purpose at hand. The list here won't be exactly the same as at your institution, but their purposes will be a digital library system, a data repository, an institutional repository, a catalog, an ILS, or a, or a library services platform, and course management and reserves systems. Our options were to continue what we had done earlier in the pandemic, which was to provide links to password protected PDFs stored in box, a very rudimentary solution. Uh, or second, a second choice would be to seek a commercial solution, which really wasn't available at the time, and which is an option of really only now becoming available. Vendors are beginning to offer this. Or to take advantage of the crisis and build some functionality that we had wanted in the past, but for which we had not had the time, the incentive, or resources. We chose this last option. We identified four areas of development that we thought would provide some longer term payoff, and they're listed here. First, implementation of the IIIF, uh, International Image Interoperability Framework. And uh, we had long wanted to use the Universal Viewer as, uh, with that. Um, they've both been on our radar for years. And we also wanted to improve our ability to um, manage and personalize services. Um, we have also been working on ways to align and normalize metadata across our various systems in recent years. And I'll talk about that a little more later in the talk. We also wanted to be sure to build functionality that complemented what we had already and could be repurposed to enhance other services. I imagine that most of you will be familiar with the six requirements listed here from the position statement posted at controlldigitallending.org. Adherence to these are likely to provide a uh, CDL implementation with the best chance of meeting the fair use factors under copyright law. DIBS, our digital borrowing system, adheres to these. Um, I'm now going to pass the baton to Mike, who will introduce you to DIBS. Hi, I'm Mike, and I'm going to describe a little bit more about the digital borrowing system, DIBS, that Caltech Library is implementing to make it possible for us to provide access to materials that we can't get electronically in another way. The basic concept is that Caltech Library staff will take materials off the shelves and scan them, and then we make the digital copies available through the controlled digital lending system implemented in DIBS. Viewer, patrons view the items through a web browser-based viewer. Um, time uh, viewing is time limited, and um, the number of copies 
available for simultaneous checkout from the system is exactly equal to the number of copies pulled from circulation. So there's always a one-to-one -one ratio. The software system consists of four main parts. There's a small server component running on our local hardware. There's a browser-based viewer. There's some automation, some workflow automation that automatic, automatically converts the scanned copies of the materials to the format needed by the viewer. And then there's a um, small a lightweight component running on Amazon Web Services to um, uh, supply the viewer with the files. Next, I will go through and show you a little bit about what the user experience is from the, both the patron and the staff user experience. So here's an example of a page describing an item available to be borrowed through dibs. We expect that patrons and students will receive information about the items relevant to a particular course through course syllabi or other communications and um, they'll be basically provide links to the pages for the items in question. So this is an example of such a page. This particular uh, book is uh, just for demo purposes, not actually something we took off the shelves. Um, and as you can see, the page provides some basic metadata about the, the title, uh, a cover page scan, and information about whether it's available, a button to request a loan, and then some information about the duration of the loan. Durations are set per item in the staff interface that I'll describe later. Uh, and if an item is not um, available for loan at the moment, there's, there'll be some text explaining why, and I'll also demonstrate that. Basically, if a student wants to request a loan for an item, for this item, uh, they click the button and they get a confirmation dialog that also provides a little bit of information about um, the, the terms of the loan. If they click OK, they proceed and are immediately sent to the viewer. This, the viewer is Universal Viewer. It's a um, open source viewing utility that is uh, compliant with IIIF. So it uses IIIF um, on the back end to, uh, to, uh, for the file format and the way that the files are fetched uh, from a service. As you can see, the, um, the interface provides what you might expect from a viewer, uh, thumbnails of the pages, uh, the ability to page through, um, the ability to zoom in on pages and so forth. And then at the top, it provides some information about the loan. Uh, one is the expiration time for this particular item, and then also a button to explicitly um, end the loan. Loans will time out, but uh, as a courtesy, if somebody is uh, wants to finish a loan, they're done with the item, um, they can request to end it immediately, and that way it's uh, the, the item becomes available to other people, or the copy of that item becomes available to other people. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and end the loan now. You get a confirmation dialog just to make sure that that's uh, what the person wanted, and then um, they can click OK, and they'll send. There's they'll be sent to a thank you page that also has a link to uh, where they can provide anonymous feedback um, for us if they if they want to tell us about their experience. And if I go back now to the same item for that, you can see. Whoops, you can see the. Um, uh, that the text now provides information about the terms of the loan changing because now it's uh, there's a period of time after someone loans it loans an item that they uh, basically kind of a, a cooling off period before they can loan the same item again. So uh, this is one of the messages it might they might receive the person might receive uh, telling them that it's too soon after they last borrowed the same item. And it tells them when it's going, going to be available again and the button is uh, disabled. Okay, so that's basically the, uh, the experience for uh, patrons and people who want to borrow items. Next, I will show you what it's like for the staff. So here I'm showing the top uh, page of the staff interface to dibs. This is available to users who are authenticated as staff. And as you can see, it provides information about the title and author barcode of the items available. There's a couple of examples here. There's also a column of checkboxes to determine whether or not a given item is available to be loaned, as well as information about the loan time and the number of copies being made available. The checkbox for the available to loan 
is because scanning takes time and so staff may begin to scan uh, a particular item and it may take a few days and uh, in the meantime they want to start entering information into dibs so this allows them to create an entry but not make it visible or accessible to uh, patrons until they actually make it available to loan that's what the checkbox is for so when they're done scanning um, then they can check this and then it actually is something that is available to patron for patrons to um, uh, go out and take a loan of the item uh, along the bottoms, there's a couple of uh, buttons of, uh, that you can see here. One is to add a new item. So if we click that, um, you can you get to a page where you provide basic information, barcode of the item, number of copies to be made available, and then the loan duration. Um, I'm going to just give an example here. Um, give it one copy for six hours. And when you click Add, what it does is it goes and pulls information from our ILS, which is tinned, um, to get the information about the title, author, and other uh, metadata from the ILS based on the barcode. So as you can see, it's filled out the uh, information for uh, what I just put in, which is, I think, the um, must have been the ghost map one at the bottom here. Um, and uh, I didn't have to type that in. It got it automatically. The um, and it's as you can see, it's not marked to available to loan because um, it, that takes a human interaction to uh, to make that actually available to be borrowed. At the right, there's an item. Uh, there's a button for editing an item in case you need to change some parameters, so number of copies or the loan duration. Um, and then there's a uh, button to copy the link to the page describing the item, and it has the button to loan to do the loans. Um, clicking on the title of the item also sends you to that page. Um, so as you can see here, um, this is the one I just added. And because I didn't check the available to loan, um, it's marked as not currently available through dibs. We'll go back to this. Um, and then the barcode is a link to the item in our ILS, in this case, TIN. So if I click that, it just sends me to the page in our, in our, our library system. And then at the bottom, the other button is manage item list. And if you click that, that brings another page uh, listing the items. And currently, the only functionality is to disable, or sorry, delist um, the item and basically take it out of the DIBS system if that's necessary for whatever reason. In the future, we may add some more functionality to that. And that's basically, uh, basically the system for um, for dibs uh, for staff and uh, there's some additional pages for um, uh, with help information for users and uh, and uh, the feedback page which I mentioned before but uh, this is basically it so just a few words about the architecture of the system it's written in Python it uses a framework called bottle and it is um, it uses an SQL light database for storing information about items and loans. The universal viewer is written in JavaScript. That's an open source component we got from other developers. And the backend IIIF serverless application is also written in um, uh, JavaScript once under Node.js on Amazon Lambda. Um, images are scanned to TIFF and then converted to pyramidal TIFFs, and that's what's served to the viewers by the serverless IIIF component. We were careful about patron privacy, so the information stored is basically the minimum we could get away with. Um, we store only the institutional identity of the person making a loan and the title and duration, and only during the time of the loan. Nothing is kept afterward, no statistics. We don't, we, it, the system doesn't record who borrowed what when. Um, it's just not kept at all. So uh, we tried to be careful about um, the privacy of patrons. And uh, that's basically it. The system is available now on GitHub. Um, it uh, is still in development, so we're improving it. And uh, hopefully, we'll make it um, more capable and robust in, uh, in a short time. But it's functional now, and um, we're getting feedback from people now. So um, if you're interested, please uh, let us know uh, what more we could do with it. Thanks.
Thanks, Mike. During the remainder of this talk, I'm going to discuss our plans for further development of DIDS, focusing on a version that will support special collections and archive virtual reading room services, and then describe how that fits into a broader approach to building services around repositories and digital assets. Here I have listed the six control digital lending requirements on the left-hand side in an abbreviated form with a special collections version on the right-hand side. Um, these are not intended to be a similar list of special collections requirements, but just prompts for the sorts of questions and considerations we will have to take into account when providing virtual reading room services. Just as with the general collection, Special collections materials are generally owned by the institution, usually without the associated copyright. Donated collections will have donor agreements, but of course the vast majority of these predate the internet and therefore usually don't include any sort of perpetual license to provide uh, online access. So ambiguity exists just as it does with general collections. The issue of the owned to loaned ratio and one user at a time is much less relevant as special collections use, use is historically very different from general collection practices. However, given that the institution is often not the copyright holder, being able to tightly control access would be important. For instance, being able to provide access to a specific class of users for a research or educational purpose would be highly desirable and often defensible under fair use. Providing copies of special collections materials for personal or educational use is a very common service, but there needs to be the ability to control what materials can be downloaded and by whom. The bottom line is that there are strong parallels between the CDL requirements and the needs of a virtual reading room. The main difference is the need to vary access controls by patron and by item and those are the changes that, that we will make in generalizing DIBs for use in the special collections context. There will also need to be an integration with archive space, which will be the metadata source in this case, and the relevant digital assets. I'd like to finish with a brief look at the context in which this would happen. This diagram is obviously a greatly simplified overview of our architecture, but it summarizes our approach. DIBS is one of a number of projects that aim to be as simple as possible and to, and to avoid duplication of already existing services without adding dependencies. We are in the process of migrating to the Folio Library Services platform for its breadth, modularity, and being open source. We are integrating Islandora and archive space functionality to minimize metadata replication and to provide an integrated user experience. And although we are tracking all our digital asset management metadata in archive space and storing access copies in Islandora, at least for the time being, we are avoiding using a single repository for our master copies, preferring a mixture of local, local storage, cloud storage, such as Glacier, and tape storage, along with selected use of Chronopolis for preservation of master files. The Caltech People Project aims to create consistent representation of researchers across all our systems building on archive space agent records. Feeds is a service that provides repository data in a variety of formats for use in web pages or for consumption by other services. A key, design, a key design feature of feeds is that services are built against static copies of metadata that is written out of repositories nightly. This not only provides very easily consumed data, but, as a for, but is a form of continuous migration um, and provides a daily backup copy of all of our repository metadata as a, as a bonus. Our nascent publishing services platform is another example of um, very simple components combined with existing services to provide an easily sustainable uh, supported and sustainable environment. This Cell Atlas is the first book published by the library on our open publishing platform, which combines Caltech Data, our data repository, GitHub, our studio, and Bookdown, 
which is an RStudio package for long form authoring using Markdown. Our approach uses a lightweight framework of open source tools to produce sustainable publications. The Cell Atlas was published in late 2020, and we plan to work with other authors on campus to create additional books in a similar manner. The Markdown markup language and RStudio make it straightforward for authors to prepare their manuscripts and for the library to render multimedia publications online. Our approach is not unique and has been embraced in various ways across many institutions and projects, but I hope that both DIBS and its integration into our, our environment, as we have described it, um, has been instructive and, and helpful. Here are links to the slides and the projects that I have mentioned, along with contact information for the principal architect in each case. Feel free to contact any one of us with your questions. Thank you very much.